Hey guys, today we're going to take a look at gender classification using machine learning. What I'm going to do is split this into subtasks. First, we're going to take a look at problem definition, then problem identification, and then we're going to determine characteristic features for our problem. We'll deal with each step one at a time. So problem definition, or what exactly are we trying to accomplish? The problem is to determine if a person is male or female just by looking at their name. Problem identification, or what type of problem are we dealing with? Since we have two predefined groups, male and female, that all samples need to be labeled, we are dealing with a classification problem. This classification problem can be solved with supervised learning. So we need to train a classification model against a set of sample names labeled male or female. So now determining characteristic features, we ask ourselves, what in a person's name do you think determines their gender? Here's a list of features that I came up with for general names. So there's the first letter of the name, the second letter of the name, the last letter, the second from last letter, the frequency of each alphabet in the name, that is the number of times that each alphabet occurs. Then there's the frequency of alphabet pairs, which is the number of times alphabet pairs occurs like AA or BA or CA. And then we have the frequency of alphabet triplets. Now note that this list is not exhaustive. There are many other features that you can consider like position of each character in the name, the length of the name itself, or anything like so. Feel free to brainstorm all sorts of possibilities, but let's work with these for now. Let's perform feature extraction on a sample name, because we just want to know what's what. Consider the name James. What are their features? So the first letter is J, the second letter is A, the last letter is S, the second from last letter is E, the frequency distribution of the alphabets is 1J, 1A, 1M, 1E, 1S, and the other alphabets are 0. The frequency distribution of alphabet pairs is 1JA, then we have 1AM, 1ME, 1ES, and 0 of the other possible pairs. And then we have the frequency distribution of alphabet triplets, which is 1JAM, 1AME, 1MES, and 0 of the other possibilities. Okay, that's cool. Like this, we can convert every name into a list of features. But wait, these features are non-numeric. Can we really just train a model with these non-numeric list of features? The answer is, it depends on the model you use. Sometimes you just can't use it, and at other times it just doesn't make sense to use raw variables as features. I'll be using random forest classification, which can work with non-numeric features. However, I will still convert these features into numeric vectors so that this will work for any other classification model you want to try in the future. It's a pain in the ass, but I'm willing to do it for you. Subscribe. For this conversion to numeric values, we will use one-hot encoding. Think of a one-hot vector as a vector of binary values where only one value is hot, or on, and the other values are cold, or off. Oh, by the way. A vector is a 1 cross n or an n cross 1 matrix. Just thought I'd throw it in there. Let's convert James into a numeric representation, one characteristic at a time. I call these seven fields as characteristics and not features. Our task is to generate numeric features from these characteristics. The first characteristic is first character of name. The size of the one hot vector is equal to the number of possible values of this field. The first character can take one value from 26 different values. Hence, the first characteristic is a 26-dimensional vector. And since J is the 10th alphabet, the 10th entry is hot, or on, while the others are zeros, off. Each of these 26 values represents a feature. So we have generated 26 features from this first characteristic, that is, first character of name. Now the second characteristic is the second character of the name. This also has 26 possibilities, and is hence represented by a 26-dimensional one-hot feature vector. The specific vector in this case is the first entry as 1, and the rest are zeros. This represents A. 
Likewise, the third characteristic, which is the last character of the name, is a 26-dimensional vector with the 19th entry as 1. This represents the letter S. The fourth characteristic is the second from last character. This has the fifth entry as 1 to represent E, and this is also a 26-dimensional vector. The next characteristic, frequency distribution of alphabets, is a tad different. We won't use one-hot encoding here. Instead, we create a 26-dimensional vector with the frequency of occurrences marked for each alphabet. Note that this vector is not one-hot. This vector neither has binary values, nor is only one entry on for every name sample. The sixth characteristic is frequency distribution of alphabet pairs. The first and second alphabets can be one of 26 characters, so the number of possible values is 26 times 26, that is 676. Hence, a 676 dimensional one hot feature vector is used to represent this entire characteristic. The seventh characteristic is frequency distribution of alphabet triplets. The three characters can be anything from AAA to ZZZ, and there are over 17,000 possibilities, that is 26 cube. If we were to create a one-hot vector, this characteristic would mean an additional 17,000 features. When I used this characteristic for every name during training, the training time increased exponentially. Furthermore, I got an exception because some names have two characters, so we'll exclude this characteristic from our analysis. We now combine these vectors by appending them sequentially to get the final feature vector of size 806. So what are its constituents? The first character of the name is determined by the first 26 features. The second character of the name is determined by features 27 to 52. The last character is given by features 53 to 78. The second to last character is given by features 79 to 104. The alphabet frequency in the name is given by features 105 to 130. And finally, we have the alphabet pair frequency, which is given by the remaining features 131 to 806. And so, we have successfully converted these six non-numeric characteristics into 806 numeric features, up and ready for analysis. Like I mentioned before, we are going to train a random force classifier. Before I explain this, it's important to understand two key terms, bootstrapping and bagging. Bootstrapping is a method of accurately determining a statistic. These statistics are aggregate quantities that cannot be directly observed. For example, the mean of test scores of students in a class. Consider a school with a thousand students. One can easily compute the mean math score of all students with a simple formula. That is, taking the sum of all scores and dividing it by the total number of students. Say we have the test scores of 10 students as 10, 25, 36, 37, 32, 85, 49, 97, 24, and 23. Well, this class is pathetic. Then the sample mean would be 41.8, using the formula just mentioned. To compute the mean using bootstrapping, we would perform the following steps. Generate subsample groups from the population, where repetition is allowed. Then we calculate the mean of each group. Then calculate the mean of those means. Considering a population of size n is divided into m subsample groups with repetition, the general formula for computing bootstrapped mean is this. Say we create six subsample groups of the same length. We compute the mean for each of these groups. Taking the number of subsample groups m as 6 in the equation stated, the new bootstrap mean is calculated to be 38.04. Note that these samples can be resampled, so as soon as you pick a sample from the population, you can put it back in the mix. Multiple occurrences of the same sample is thus possible. And no, this is not cheating, it's just how bootstrapping works. Here are some other sample groups that we could have chosen. You see that in the first case we have the repetition of 10, and in the second case we have a repetition of 23. The difference between the bootstrapped mean, 38.04, and the original mean, 41.8, may seem trivial. However, this is just a simple example to illustrate bootstrapping. 
Real-world applications would involve the construction of hundreds of sample groups from a population. We perform bootstrapping because bootstrapped quantities better represent the statistic of a population. Greater the number of equally distributed subsamples can yield more accurate statistics. We now move on to bagging. Bagging stands for bootstrap aggregation. It is an approach to ensemble learning based on the bootstrapping technique. An ensemble learning algorithm is one which combines the predictions of similar models in order to compute its own prediction. Bagging is generally used with decision trees. Decision trees are structurally unstable. They are sensitive to data used during training. This means that minor changes in the training set can affect the structure and hence the predictions of the resulting tree. To perform bagging, we first divide the training set into a number of sub-training sets. Then, each training set is used to train a decision tree. The average prediction of all decision trees is the final prediction. For example, in the classification of a human as male or female, say that we have trained 10 decision trees. If 7 of them predict the output as male, and the remaining 3 predict it as female, then the human sample is labeled male. Majority rules. Bagging reduces the output variance of the final prediction, despite the fact that the individual models themselves have high variance. Now that we know about bootstrapping and bagging, it'll be easier to understand random forests. Random forest is named as such because it is constructed from a number of decision trees. In a traditional bagged decision tree, Every node takes a look at all n features of training data and chooses one feature and a threshold value where the split is optimal. That is, a split point is chosen. Random forests, on the other hand, only look at a subset of the n features in order to choose the split point. In classification problems, the number of features considered by a node is the square root of the number of total features. For regression, a good rule of thumb is to choose about one-third the number of features. So for our gender classification problem with 806 features, each node will decide to split point considering approximately 28 randomly selected features. Why? Because 28 is the approximate square root of 806. Doing this significantly reduces the training time while providing great performance. In order to build a random forest, we first split the data into overlapping subsample groups. We then train each group against a decision tree where the sample points of each node are determined based on the improved method that I just mentioned. Then during testing, we determine the overall output based on the prediction of all decision trees. Now, in the case of a classification problem, the prediction of the random forest would be the mode of the prediction of the constituent decision trees. In regression, the prediction is the average, once again, very similar to bagging. In fact, random forests are just the improved version of the bagged decision trees. The main difference is the number of parameters required to construct their structures. Bag decision trees can be constructed from one parameter, the number of subsample groups from the population. Random forests, however, require two parameters. The first is the number of trees. This is equal to the number of subsample groups constructed from the population. Same as the bag decision trees. Additionally, we require the number of features each node should search in order to get the optimal split point. This is all the end features for bagged decision trees. So great, we now determined some characteristics, we generated our features, and we got to know about our model. Now let's take a look at the code. We'll be using Python 3.6 for this one. I finally got around to installing Anaconda without having my other projects break. So yeah, let's just dive in. We'll start with the modules. Collections is used for computing frequency distribution of characters in a word. NLTK is the Natural Language Processing Toolkit. Since I'm only going to use it for the dataset, I'll save you the trouble of installing it and provide the dataset files in the repository. Random is used to shuffle male and female names for training. NumPy is used to reshape testing data from a 2D matrix to a 1D vector. 
Without this, I get a deprecation warning. Then we have the random forest classifier. This is a part of scikit-learn. So this allows us to train random forest classifier for gender classification. Accuracy score computes the performance of our classifier. ASCII uppercase is a string of all uppercase alphabets used to construct the one-hot vectors that I mentioned before. The dataset I was talking about is two text files with 5,000 male and female names. We'll need to first extract these names into two separate lists. This can be done with or without NLTK. The output is the same regardless. Some of these names contain special characters, so I'll filter them out. Next, we convert all these alphabets into uppercase. This is done because your one-hot arrays are case sensitive. We would need to define an additional 26 features for every characteristic otherwise. And the last one would have 52 squared features instead of 26 squared, that is 776. This adds up to way too much processing time and your data is unnecessarily verbose. So it makes sense to convert the names into a single case. We then append a label M for male names and F for female names before putting it all together to form our dataset. The first, second, third, fourth, and sixth characteristics require one hot encoding. The first four are the same type, constructed from a 26 dimensional one hot vector, so I create a dictionary of one hot vectors for every alphabet. I do the same for alphabet pairs and triplets. I included the code for triplets just for reference, but I do not recommend its usage. Since the features are numeric, it is difficult to tell which of them are the most important. Hence, we create a list of such feature names in the same order of the actual features. We write a method called getSample that takes the training input name and gender, and then it creates the training sample by constructing the 806 features and appending a label. To get the 26 features corresponding to the frequency of alphabets, a dictionary of size 26 is constructed with keys as the alphabets and the values as the frequencies, initialized to zero. We then get the frequency distribution of characters in the name and update the dictionary. A similar procedure is followed for determining the frequency distribution of alphabet pairs. We also convert the label into its numeric form, the label is 0 for male and 1 for female. A small quirk with the solution, although it looks like female is greater than male because 1 is greater than 0, which really doesn't make sense in this case. And since we're dealing with random force, you really could just leave it as M and F, but eh, it's okay. In the end, we return a feature vector and the classification, and that together constitute the sample. The function is executed for all samples, training, and testing. We then shuffle up our samples and divide it into training and testing sets. Then, we use scikit-learn's random force classifier. N estimators is the number of constituent decision trees that we wish to construct. This is equivalent to the number of subsample groups that our training data is divided. I also specify the min sample split argument. This is the number of training samples required to split a node. Note that I didn't explicitly specify the number of features to consider for every node because the square root is the default. Once the training is complete, we start testing our random force classifier and compute the simple accuracy. I got an 82% performance, which is pretty good. You could stop here, but we're curious to see how important each of the 806 features are to our classification problem. Everything we do from here on out is feature engineering. I displayed the top 20 features here. This list may be a tad different in every execution. One time when I executed this, four of the most important features were checking if the name ends with A, determining the frequency of A, checking if the name ends with E, and checking if the second to last character was an N. I'll rewrite the program including one feature at a time and observing its effects. For the first round, I check if the name ends with an A. Surprisingly, I'm able to get a 60 to 65% accuracy just by checking this condition. Next, I calculate the frequency of A. 
This result doesn't increase that much, but we see that the score makes more 64 and 65 percent accuracies. I add the third feature of determining if the name ends with E. The accuracy range just jumps between 69 and 72 percent. Finally, I add the fourth feature where I check if the second to last character of the sample name is N. This increases the accuracy to a point where nearly every time the performance is above 70% and the top accuracy is nearly 75%. So basically, we achieved an 82% performance considering 806 features, but a 75% performance with just 4 features. It's pretty neat, right? But we can go much higher. With additional feature engineering, parameter tuning for your random forest model, and appropriate characteristic selection for your names, you can further increase this performance. Just remember that the type of name you choose for training and testing also determine the performance. Names of a specific region are similar, so training against such names would yield a higher classification accuracy. So when I say that, I mean like all American names, or training it against Indian names, or training against Chinese names, like so. And yeah, that's it. I hope you guys got something out of this video. I'll put this Jupyter Notebook along with the code on GitHub. The link will be down in the description below the video. If you guys liked the video, just hit that like button and subscribe on your way out for more amazing videos. And thank you for watching. Bye.